Good morning and welcome to St. Clements. My name is Joy Kairos. I'm the priest here and it is a privilege and pleasure to worship with all of you today. 
A few things as we prepare for today's service. First of all, today our preacher is Brian Bliss, our assistant for discipleship. It is wonderful to get to work with Brian as a colleague and as a friend, and um, it is always wonderful to have him in our pulpit, or at least standing here in front of the camera and microphone that best pick up for Zoom. Because as you all know, right now we are gathered in this space, but we also have members of our community who are Zooming in for our worship services. So friends at home, feel free to pour yourself a second cup and know that I am so glad that you are here with us. Throughout this service, you will notice that we ask people to stay masked. Those leading worship, such as myself, will unmask, and part of that is so that our friends at home can better hear us. We are running into some issues around muffling, but we are being mindful of distance and remaining masked whenever we are in close proximity to others. Which leads me to my next point, which is, every single day, we are wrestling with what is the best course of action to mitigate risk and allow for gathering as this body. And we continue to wrestle and try to respond in the best ways we can so that we can feel good about knowing that we are doing our best to keep our community, including our most vulnerable members, safe. So I just wanted to share with you a few things that are continuing so that you can know some of what is going on behind the scenes. So, first of all, we are paying attention to the science and the numbers of COVID cases in our community. We are continuing to offer a variety of services. Our 815 service is outdoors when weather permits. Um, we move indoors when weather does not permit, but that service does not include any singing. 10.30 service, available on Zoom as well as in person, does include congregational singing with masks on and our choir with masks on. And then while weather continues to permit, we are having a service specifically intended for folks with members of their household who are not yet eligible for vaccines outside, and that's Pizza Church, and we'll be having that today at 5.00. So like I said, we are offering a breadth of opportunities in hopes that everybody has an access point. As we continue in this time, recognizing that at some point we probably will, will need to close windows and doors. The vestry will be looking at a proposal for commercial air filters for this space. Um, morning, they are not pretty machines but they have the kind of HEPA and MERV filters that we are being told are effective in helping to mitigate risk in indoor spaces. So the vestry will be looking at that proposal tomorrow night at our Zoom vestry meeting. So please know the vestry is paying attention and trying to make sure that the decisions we make and the course of action we take both follow science and also allow us to feel reasonably okay about how we are mitigating risk. <clears throat> Speaking of mitigating risk, the vestry has approved the purchase of an AED. Um, and for those of you who are new to the Episcopal Church, um, the vestry is the governing board in our denomination. Um, and for those of you who don't know what an AED is, it's an automatic external defibrillator. Um, we are going to have one on site in case of cardiac emergency and um, all of this is possible because of all of you, not the cardiac emergencies, <laughs> but our ability to invest in things that we hope will help keep our community and each other safer. Which brings me to my next point, which is today is the final in-gathering of our annual pledge campaign. This is the campaign that funds our 2022 fiscal year, which starts January 1st. Once all of the pledges are in, we will then take a look at the budget and figure out what we can do this coming year with the resources that have been entrusted to this community. So please know that today is that in-gathering and phone calls to folk who've pledged in years past but have not yet submitted theirs will begin shortly thereafter. 
So if you still need a card or a new one would like to participate, there are some at the crossing, sort of to the, depending on which direction you're at, at the welcome table over there. So knowing that who we are is not bound by time, October 31st and then the following Sunday, we'll be marking all souls and all saints on All Souls, we'll be specifically offering a service in commemoration of the faithful departed. That means that at that service, as well as at our All Saints service the following week, we will be reading a list of the names of those who have died who are known to our congregation. So if you have names to submit, please do so in the next week, week and a half or so, because we are hoping to do that on the 31st as well as on All Saints. We felt that this was a year when we needed a little bit more time to really sit with the truth that we have lost much in this season. Part of our observance of All Saints and All Souls will be our Saint Walk, which we did last year outside on the green, we will have photos and stories of the saints in our lives. If you submitted those last year, we have saved them. Those will be posted again. If you would like to add um, a photo and story of a saint in your life, please submit those along with any names to the office as soon as possible. We will be then printing them and laminating them for the walk out on the green. Two more announcements and then I'll stop. In case you're wondering, we're a very busy place as we seek to do God's will in the world. So after this service, there is a presentation about a pilgrimage in 2023 to England. And that pilgrimage will have two components, a walking pilgrimage and a musical pilgrimage. So if you are interested in learning more about that, you can do so by heading to the library after this service. Also know that that will also be available via Zoom. You can simply stay on the worship Zoom and it will segue into a pilgrimage um, information session in the parish hall. And please know um, you do not have to be in the choir or our youth to participate. We are trying to make sure that everyone in our community feels like they have the opportunity to experience pilgrimage. And this is my last announcement. Um, on the 20th, our Aging Grace group will be reconvening. We had to move the date, um, and so that is this coming Wednesday. Brian Bliss, our Assistant for Discipleship, will be there and will be sharing some about an oral history project in conjunction with a story project that we will be doing as a congregation. So um, all are welcome if you are interested in participating and connecting with some other folk who want to explore the joys and challenges of aging. That will be at Episcopal Church Homes at 5 p.m. There is more information online. Now, oh, the hymn board. This is the last announcement. The hymn board's totally wrong. Ignore it. It's all on your beige insert. If you sing those, you'll be singing alone to the beat of a different drummer. And now, Scott. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, my name is Scott Marcellus. And my husband, Jim Morehouse, and I have been members here at St. Clement's for most of our adult lives. I remember the first time I got a, a direct stewardship ask. Um, I believe it was from Mark Stahura. Um, <laughs> probably was either the stewardship chair or a warden at that time. Um, and I felt too insecure to financially pledge. I was worried that I would pledge, make a commitment, and not be able to meet it. Since then, I've regretted that decision. Um, because I've learned that the commitment to giving forges a connection to the community. Also, now, giving has become so much easier with automatic deduction. So I never fall behind or spend the money on other things and then panic when that giving statement arrives. Over our time at St. Clement's, the nature of our giving has continuously changed. There were periods when we struggled to make ends meet, 
despite working multiple jobs, and Sunday was our only day off together. During those times, showing up once a month on a Sunday was what we could do. Other times we've had the capacity to volunteer in multiple ministries, both visible and invisible, plus give financially. And always, St. Clements has given back so much to us through friendships and community, through our opportunity to give of ourselves and grow, and by connecting us to others locally, in Haiti, and to the Anglican Church when we travel abroad and experience the liturgy simultaneously familiar and different. As we consider how we'll budget our charitable giving for 2022, we plan on prioritizing giving through St. Clement's, meeting the challenge of increasing our pledge, and also setting aside funds for the global mission in Haiti and for an anticipated capital campaign. Our building means so much to us, and, we, and making sure that it is preserved for the future is a personal priority. So we will be dedicating ourselves to its support with our time, talents, and treasure. And I hope that you will consider doing the same. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Now, before we sing our entrance hymn, number 477, as it is in your hymn books, once again, that's hymn 477, let's have a moment of silence as we prepare to worship God in this space.
Our service continues on the front page of your bulletin. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that your grace may always proceed and follow us, that we may continually be given to good works. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the proclamation of Scripture. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away, who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, will make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured himself to death, out himself to death, and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressor. The word of the Lord. And thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 91, verses 9 through 16. Since we have no notes, the choir will sing. The rest of us will try our best. <laughs>
A reading from Hebrews. Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is subject to weakness. And because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for those of the people. And one does not presume to take this honor, but takes it only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you, as he says also in another place. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And he, they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be the first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. to my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our strength and redeemer. Amen. Before I start the sermon, if you've ever seen the movie uh, Shrek, when Lord Farquaad has to get up on his uh, horse and they bring out the little stool, that's what this kind of feels like. Um, so I admit uh, that this is one of my all-time favorite gospel passages. Mostly because I think it's one of those moments in the Bible 
where we read it with an earnest heart and mind. We read it as this very solemn moment where Jesus is teaching the disciples, where he is predicting once again, not only his death, but also his resurrection and the atonement for all of our sins. So it's very, very serious. It is not a funny story at all. The people who organize the lectionary must think the same thing, especially with pairing of the Isaiah text for today. Now, it's likely the definition of coming in hot to go after the lectionary within two paragraphs of a sermon. <laughs> but know, know that most weeks I have an almost unblemished regard for the lectionary and for the way that it keeps preachers accountable to a rhythm of scripture passages. But let's go back to this gospel reading for just a minute. Let me set the scene for you. The disciples and Jesus, as they do, are traveling and talking, and the Zebedee boys, as I like to call them, that's James and John, come up to Jesus and they're like, hey, Jesus, we want you to do whatever we ask. <laughs> now, if you've ever been a parent or in charge of children, in any way, you know that this isn't going to go anywhere good. <laughs> and Jesus plays it cool, naturally. He's been here before with his friends, the disciples. He says, okay, what do you want me to do for you? And this is where I imagine James and John looking at each other. Because the plan is working. <laughs> and they're out with it. We want to sit at your right hand and your left hand. I imagine they would sit fast, almost breathlessly. And Jesus is like, you don't know what you're asking for. Can you drink of the cup that I drink or be baptized with that which I am baptized? Again, I imagine the brothers looking at each other, thinking, should we say yes? <laughs> because this likely isn't the answer that they hope to get. They likely wanted Jesus to acknowledge their cleverness, the ability to see themselves as leaders in the coming kingdom. So despite their surprise, they nod their heads, as serious as possible, I'm sure, and they say, we are able. And this is the part that I think is funny. Nobody can tell me that the evangelist who wrote as Mark isn't giving us a wink-wink in this little moment. A little, can you get a load of these guys? <laughs> because Jesus says, well, guess what? You're going to be baptized with how I was baptized. You're going to drink the cup I drink. But that original question you ask, well, that's not mine to grant. So he essentially tells them, get ready. Things are about to get really tough for you. And naturally, the other ten disciples aren't pleased. They confront James and John, and there's sure to be an argument. But Jesus once again uh, reorients their ideas and reality of what his kingdom looks like and what it means to be powerful. So perhaps the lectionary writers aren't completely off base. Hearing the Isaiah text is a jolt to how we expect the story of Jesus to go, perhaps even to our modern ears. I know I'm guilty of hearing the more challenging calls of Jesus, just like the one last week, and thinking, well, we can't, you can't really mean to give everything away, right? <laughs> In today's gospel, the disciples are still thinking about this world, temporal concerns. But Jesus is trying to get them to imagine something bigger. Something so different that maybe it feels incongruent in every single way. It goes against all of their and our ideas about security, and maybe even what we think is right and wrong. Nothing about it makes sense with what they've been taught. Except, it's coming from the mouth of Jesus. The one that the disciples and all of us call Messiah. Now the other texts for today are doing a similar thing. In the Hebrew passage, we're told that Christ is the high priest, the one who brings an intimate connection between creator and creation. And if we were to glance at the other version of today's lectionary readings, track one, you would see a reading from the book of Job. And it's the moment right after Job finishes complaining, and rightfully so, I might add, and God in his response speaks to him from a whirlwind. In all of today's passages, there is a certain amount of grandeur but at the same time, there's a relationship. God is ultimate, yet God is intimate. Beyond, yet within. And when we hear these passages, we're asked to remember that we worship a God who speaks. A God who is present. 
We worship a God who tells us that there's more than the temporal, more than what we see now, that everything, all of this, is going to change. The question becomes, of course, how do we live in between those two places? How do we dream of a bigger world while not allowing ourselves to become separated from the actual world? And this, I think, is where a major misreading of the Mark passage occurs. In verse 45, he's addressing the disciples, and Jesus says, For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, before we go any further, we should acknowledge that, oof, this is kind of a tough one. Does this make anybody else nervous, a ransom for many? If you raised your hand or nodded along, then you're not alone. Atonement theories, or the work of trying to figure out the hows and the whys of the work on the cross, often remind me of a cheap pair of shoes. (laughs) They're easy to find, and the more you walk around in them, the more they start to bug you. And I admit that I think Episcopalians that we should be talking about the atonement, about atonement theories, in our daily lives, around the Zoom water cooler, at the grocery store. This might just be me. (laughs) But I don't think that we should cede this language or the idea that Christ's death and resurrection have meaning not only for this world, but for us personally. When I think about this, and as I did research, a quote from the writer and theologian N.T. Wright give, gave, gives us perhaps one of the most beautiful theories of atonement. It's a longer quote, but I'm going to share it with you. We have, alas, belittled the cross, imagining it merely as a mechanism for getting us off the hook for our own petty naughtiness or as an example of some general benevolent truth. It is much, much more. It is the moment when the story of Israel reaches its climax. The moment when, at last, the watchmen on Jerusalem's walls see their God coming into the kingdom. The moment when the people of God are reviewed, renewed, so as to be, at last, the royal priesthood, who will take over the world, not with the love of power, but with the power of love. The moment when the kingdom of God overcomes the kingdom of the world, it is the moment when a great old door, locked and barred since our first disobedience, swings open suddenly to reveal not just the garden, open once more to our delight, but the coming city, the garden city that God had always planned and is now inviting us to go through the door and build with him. The dark power that stood in the way of this kingdom vision has been defeated, overthrown, rendered null and void. Its legions will still make a lot of noise and cause a lot of grief, but the ultimate victory is now assured. This is the vision of the evangelists offer us as they bring together the kingdom and the cross. So when we hear words like ransom, again, especially in conjunction with these week's texts, we should not follow our instincts and plug our ears and just hum until the next week's lectionary readings come around. (laughs) James Williams, who's a René Girard scholar, looks to redefine the meaning of ransom in this passage. And he wants to bring it to closer to something like liberation. He wants to recast the sacrificial language as not a divine mandate, but instead a way for us to see one another, to see ourselves as connected to something greater. Williams extends this idea to the notion of the servant in the same passage, wondering if it's not simply an individual servant, but maybe something that points us to a broader collective, a community of people who live and serve one another. Another theologian, Robert Hamilton Kelly, takes this, and he argues that for Christians, in fact, the biggest question of this passage is not why Jesus died for our sins, but rather why people did not stand up in covenant of nonviolence against the powers of humanity that sentenced and executed Jesus. I think we are asked the same questions today through these readings. Do we stand in a covenant with Jesus? Or do we allow Jesus to stand alone? How do we understand the baptism with which we were baptized, the cup that we are offered to drink? Can we see that great old door being swung open wide for us? Can we catch a glimpse of that garden once again? Now this week, Joy mentioned it a little bit, every household will be receiving one of these journals. They're 
full of different story prompts. Um, 32 pages of just different ways for us to kind of think about and process the past 19 months of the pandemic. We made these as a way to bring about a community theology project, a way for all of us to tell our stories of the pandemic, and to use those stories as a way to start the healing process, and maybe even, perhaps, help ourselves and others catch a glimpse of what N.T. Wright calls the coming city. We're also going to be delivering these journals to local businesses and nonprofits. If you have connections or places where you might like to see them, let me know. And with the goal of collecting and curating a sort of oral history of the past 19 months, a truly communal story sharing experience. And over the next few months, you'll have opportunity to participate as well through the reflections of these story journals, through audio and video, a testimonials, art projects, any way that you might be led to respond, to share a lament, a joy, anything from the past 19 months. Now, admittedly, one of the golden rules of sermon writing is not to come to a sermon with an idea, <laughs> something that you plan to make the text prove. I confess that when Joy and I discussed me preaching this week, we also discussed how I could use the sermon as an opportunity to introduce you to these story journals. <laughs> So when I saw today's scripture readings, I was like, well, I guess there's always next time. <laughs> but the more I sat with this week's passages, the more I saw a connection. The more I reflected on the importance of not only community, but the sort of community I think Jesus is proposing to us in the gospel. A community where we are free to let our stories be heard. A community where we can accept the burden of hearing other people's stories. A community that is unlike anything else in the world. A chance to stand in between. To honor the pain and the sorrow of the last 19 months while simultaneously pointing to something new. Pointing to something different. Pointing hopefully to something better than we can possibly imagine. Remember that our actions matter and bring hope to the world. 
May we pursue the common good instead of individual desires. And may we express love for folks we disagree with. Lord, have mercy on us. May we work for justice instead of retribution. May we have the will to reverse climate change and the health to do so. And may there be a livable earth for future generations. Lord, have mercy on us. May we pursue unity. May all people have equal access to voting and representation. And may we come to truly understand what it means to love our neighbors. Lord, have mercy on us. That we will have the strength to do the hard work of doing the right thing. That we will have the wisdom to discern truth from competing narratives and that our anger turns into action and we express the inner light of Christ. Lord, have mercy on us. We give thanks for diversity. We pray for a spiritual revival and return to faith. And we pray that we will find a way to knit the broken body of Christ back together. Lord, have mercy on us. That we embrace transformative change, that we have the courage to put public welfare ahead of personal freedoms, and that we remember we are all in this together. Lord, have mercy on us. May we have vaccine approval for children soon. May the vaccine hesitant find the information they need to choose vaccination. And for burnt out healthcare workers, teachers, and essential workers. Lord, have mercy on us. For deliverance from prejudice that people experiencing homelessness in our communities will find stable homes and for an end to gun violence. Lord, have mercy on us. In thanksgiving for technology and its power to connect us, for the balanced use of technology so that we can find wholeness and health in our lives, and for the opportunities we have to share the word of God. Lord, have mercy on us. For courage and compassion in the face of hatred and deceit, that we create and share joy, and that we have grace to see the wow all around us. Lord, have mercy on us. At this time, we invite your additional prayers, either silently or aloud. For Diana, friend of John Tremblay. For the 14 missionaries kidnapped in Haiti. For the memory of Brian Coland. In the communion of all the saints, the living and the dead, imperfect and made whole, in the fullness of God's love, let us commend ourselves, one another, and all our life to Christ our God.
O God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus, your Son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love and work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth. That in your good time, all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. May the peace of Christ be always with you. Please share with one another a sign of Christ's peace. Peace be with you. Mm -hmm. Please be seated. We have about a dozen devices signed into Zoom, so we have about 15 more folk who are worshiping with us from home. Um, and what a gift it is to share the space. As we continue in our service, I had a question emerge about our prayers of the people. On the 3rd of October, I invited the congregation to speak up and share whatever prayers were on folks' heart and mind that they needed to share with this community and with God. So the litany we have is comprised entirely of your voices. So please know that that is where that particular set of prayers has come from and that it represents members of both our 815 and 1030 congregations. As we continue in fellowship together today, a couple of things about communion. We will serve the pulpit side first, then the eagle side. We have bread as well as gluten-free wafers. The gluten-free wafers will be set in a container on the altar, so just let us know if you need those and if you can get those out yourself so we don't cross-contaminate, that would be fantastic. Thank you so much. And for the wine, we pour from a common vessel into little cups. They are right there up in front if you wish to partake of the wine. But please know that communion in part in our tradition is considered communion in full. If for some reason you choose not to partake of either bread or wine, either is sufficient. And if you are prevented by reason of not being able to be physically present, in participating in the actual eating of the bread and the wine, please know that that spiritual yearning in our tradition is a spiritual form of communion. And there will be a prayer on your screen that will allow you to participate in that way. In this, we are made whole. Sacrifices must be made, Mary. What was that, Bob? Body. 
Bob says sorry. <laughs> Here we are, and this is us. Walk in love as Christ loves all of us. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of our might, heaven and earth. Thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In Christ you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In Christ, you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, 
This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O God, we remember the God, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in the sacrifice that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with Mary, Clement, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of all your children. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father, in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us.
Having shared the bread and cup, whether physically or spiritually, I invite you to stand as able for our post-communion prayer. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now to the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. God bless you and keep you this day and always, secure in the knowledge and love of God. Amen. Amen. Rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God. 